Welcome to the Brew Crew Review Podcast, the show by fans for fans of your Milwaukee Brewers. Welcome back to another edition of the Brew Crew Review, everybody. This is uh, Vince, and I'm joined on the set today by our co-hosts, Craig and Scott. And a very special guest uh, with us tonight is former Milwaukee Brewers pitcher Dave Pember. Dave, how are you tonight? Doing great. How about you guys? We are, are doing outstanding. And uh, for those of you who, uh, who do not know, Dave was a 1999 draft pick of the Milwaukee Brewers and made his big league debut and played for the team in 2002. Um, Dave, tell us about your love for and talent uh, in baseball growing up and how you ended up playing college baseball for Western Carolina. Well, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. I was a, a really late bloomer. Uh, my brother was six years older than me, and he was six nine. I was six, you know, three or four, and I was kind of the runt in the family. But, you know, basketball was my first love. And uh, God did not give me the ability to run or jump, uh, but he did give me the ability to have a pretty good arm. So, um, you know, I, I couldn't hit that great in high school. And my high school coach was a, a really good coach. And he said, well, all right, you just go out there and play catch and we'll see what happens with that. So I got to, I got to throw the ball a little bit harder. And then I was, you know, pretty accurate. And as a kid, you know, I, I was enamored uh, with the Ryan Express. So I try to serve sure. the ball as I could and um, oftentimes give up a lot of home runs. I had to locate and became more of a <laughs> uh, Greg Maddox type pitcher in, in no way am I in the same league as him. But um, I tried to, to approach the game more like Maddox. But I just I grew up as a fan uh, of the game. And, uh, you know, I, my uh, my family all from Cincinnati, Ohio. So I grew up, uh, grew up with the uh, – the big red machine and uh, fell in love with the reds in early age. And, um, you know, so, so baseball was kind of always in our family, but um, didn't really have much success until my senior year of high school. And then I had uh, it's funny, <clears throat> I got my debut at, at Wrigley field and I had a, a Cub scout ask me in high school, what do you want to do after high school? And I didn't really know the question he was asking me, but essentially he was saying, do you want to play professional baseball? But I, I was so naive. I had no idea what he was saying. And so I said, <laughs> well, you know, I just, I'd like to go to college and, um, you know, one day and get a degree and, and have a, a good job is kind of what I told him. But uh, <laughs> after that, I, uh, I, I kind of got thrown into the fire. I had uh, three schools that were interested, but Western Carolina University, uh, Coach Rodney Hennon, who's the uh, coach of uh, Georgia Southern now, he uh, made me an offer with uh, Keith LeClaire as the head coach, um, but uh, started out as a freshman and got thrown in the fire, had some success and had some failures too. I once gave up five home runs in an inning uh, in college, and uh, so that, that made me rebound pretty quick and work hard and continue to get better. So, um, And from there, I just you know continued to work hard and got a little bit better. That's great. And, and I mean, you wouldn't have really wanted to play for the Cubs though anyway, would you have, Dave? <laughs> well, you know, the, the, uh, as a kid, you know, growing up in uh, Tennessee, the only teams that were on were <laughs> the Reds, the Braves, and uh, the Cubs and whoever they were playing. But uh, Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so no, um, obviously the, uh, the Cubs are good rivals, but uh, they always uh, put up uh, a game, a tough game against Milwaukee, but it's nice that, that uh, Milwaukee got the upper hand. So, <laughs> absolutely. Yep. So, um, obviously, all that success that uh, you were eventually drafted by the Brewers uh, in the eighth round in the 1999 draft. Um, did you know, I guess, that you were going to be drafted, or did you think it was going to be higher or lower than that? If you could just tell us a little bit about <laughs> your draft day experience. Yeah. So it was a it was an interesting scenario. Um, you know, I. After my freshman year of college, I added two to four miles an hour in my fastball. So I don't ever remember in high school throwing over 90, but in college, I remember hitting 90, 91, 92. And then, um, you know, I think in the wooden bat league in Cape Cod, someone said I got it up to 94. And that's the first time I remembered really any scouts paying me a lot of attention. I got a bunch of phone calls and, and letters sent from probably, you know, 18 to 20 different clubs. Uh, Milwaukee was not necessarily on the radar, um, but 
you know, I was a pretty analytical player. Um, every scout that called me, I kind of interviewed them and, you know, I would drill them on where they had me slotted and what their thoughts were. And they said, you know, we can't really tell you that. And I said, okay, but if you could, where would you put me? And, and they all kind of had me somewhere in the, the third to the fifth round, but uh, I'm a type one diabetic. I was diagnosed when I was 14. And um, I think a lot of them uh, felt like that was potentially an issue, but, you know, Milwaukee, um, said it was not an issue, and um, you know they wound up drafting me in the eighth round, and you know it was just a it was a huge blessing. Um, you know at the time, you know I wanted it to be such an easy decision in college. You know I made good grades. I you know wanted to uh, I'm kind of an entrepreneur, so I wanted to have my own business one day, and it, I wanted it to be such an easy decision that either the Brewers gave me so much money that it was a no brainer, or they offered me so little that it was a no-brainer and I, I was going to go back to school. So originally it was a small market team. So uh, I had in my mind that I was probably just going to go back to college, but um, Milwaukee was a uh, tremendous to me. Um, you know, the scouts that drafted me, Steve Connolly, uh, spent a lot of time trying to convince me that um, Milwaukee was the place where I needed to be and how the fans were. And I think actually they had a couple of guys on the team call me at that time Um I think Woodard, maybe Steve Woodard. Sure. Uh, right. sure. Yeah. I, th I think he called me maybe. And um, I think he went straight out of high school. And so, you know, I, I planned to go back to college, um, but then the Milwaukee came back and made me a really nice offer. And um, I just felt like it was the right time and, and it seemed like a no brainer. So uh, moved on and, and I was really fortunate. I was blessed if, um, you know, because Milwaukee brings up a lot of talent and they develop a lot of talent from the minor leagues, which re really makes it great. And I think what makes the fan base so phenomenal in Milwaukee, because it's not like you're you're following these kids because they're traded. I mean, you know, most of the people that are diehard Milwaukee fans, they know everybody in the draft. They know what they're doing in rookie ball, A ball, double A, triple A. And they're looking forward to seeing these guys because it's, you know, kind of a family atmosphere. And that was what made Milwaukee really great. I mean, the fans are tremendous. It's kind of funny that you mentioned that because that's actually the premise of how our show started. It was a couple of years after you went through the system, but back in 2004 is when we first started our show and it was uh, really focused on, on some of the minor league players and the guys that the Brewers were just drafting in those early years in 04 and 05. And um, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. The guys were able to kind of follow the, the, the progression of these guys through the system. So um, I had a question for you then, Dave, and this is Craig. Um, First, I guess, uh, just to follow up on that, uh, how, did, how did you actually find out that you were drafted? Did the Brewers call you before they actually selected you, or was it after the fact, or was it, you know, how exactly, were, or did they tell you even ahead of time that they were going to select you? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it, it's so amazing how today, I mean, you go online and everything's at your fingertips. You know, back then, you know, I, the draft wasn't online, or if it was, I didn't have a computer. I wasn't following it on my iPhone or, you know, one of two iPhones that I have now, so it, it's kind of crazy, but it was after the fact they called me and um, I was, I think the earliest pick at that time for Steve Connolly. And uh, so he was, he was very excited about it, but I don't, I don't ever really remember meeting him. Um, but he was at a lot of my college games. And I think he, he saw me pitch in Georgia uh, against the university of Georgia. And that was one of my better games where my slider was working. And um, so he called me um, after the draft and, um, you know, congratulated me and made me the offer. And, you know, the rest is kind of history as far as that goes. Nice. Um, and then um, after you, you, were, you were signed, obviously, and after that you got into the organization. And um, between 2000 and 2002, you spent some time at a couple of affiliates, uh, the Beloit Snappers, of course, in Wisconsin, the High Desert Mavericks in California, and Huntsville Stars in Alabama. Uh, I guess, what can you tell our listeners a little bit about the your experience as you moved up through the affiliates of the Milwaukee Brewers at the time? Well, I tell you, each, uh, each environment is very different. Um, you've got uh, the Beloit Snappers, which is, uh, is obviously a Midwest town. The, uh, the fans, it's typically the same fans you see every night. I, I tell you, you know, growing up watching movies like uh, Major League and Bull Durham, um, I was finally living, you know, Bull Durham. I had a lot of uh, friends and um, you know dads of uh, of my son's teams uh, would ask me you know what is what is minor league baseball like is it anything like Bull Durham I'd say well 
it's it's precisely like Bull Durham's. Um, <laughs> uh, every every town has uh, kind of a Susan Sarandon. Every town uh, has a uh, place where you go to hang out afterwards. Um, there's a there's a veteran who uh, is on the team that helps you out, and and while he likes helping you, he he's kind of bitter because he's been in the minor leagues for so long. And then you got the hot shot rookie and I kind of fell in between, but, um, you know, it was a really good place to start. There was good talent in the Midwest league. Um, I got to spend many, many hours on uh, bus trips through, uh, you know, cornfields and they just kept going and going and going. And then of course you go out West and uh, it was, I think it was uh, Victorville, California which at the time I never spent any time in California and I didn't realize there were so many different types of people in California, Northern California and Southern California. But the, uh, the high desert Mavericks was really a challenge because it was, um, I believe it was owned by George Brett and his brothers at the time, but um, it was essentially in the desert. They dug a big hole out and they put a baseball field in. So uh, the, the infield was like uh, you get a ground ball, which I was kind of a ground ball pitcher you get a ground ball it's like hitting it on concrete and you get a uh, a routine fly ball and because it was something down in the desert you get that that breeze that goes along the the desert and it just kind of sucks the ball out so um if you've got a five era in uh in uh victorville california you're doing a good job but i tell you the interesting thing you know i kind of grew up on on a midwestern diet uh which is you know, a lot of the places I would go, meet and threes, things like that in uh, in uh, below Wisconsin. But you go to California, everything has uh, jalapenos, salsa on it. Um, you know, it's the first time I really ever tried sushi. Um, you know, I went home that off season. I asked my parents if there was any place to eat sushi. And they looked at me like, who are you now? So it was a blast getting to experience all those things. And um, it was really neat when I got to go to, uh, to double A because it was about, um, two and a half hours away from Knoxville, Tennessee, where I grew up. So my, my brother got to come to a lot of games. My uh, parents and family got to come see me pitch when I was at home. So, um, you know, Huntsville, Alabama is a, a neat city too. And that, you know, there's a, a big engineering, uh, community there. Um, a lot yeah. of smart people there. Um, I actually got my first job after baseball there. I met my wife there. Um, so Huntsville's a, Huntsville's a neat place. Um, it's unfortunate that they don't they don't have the baseball team there, but um, the Southern League was really nice. Uh, you, you know, I I remember actually I think I pitched in the single A in Beloit. I think in the championship series against Jake Peavy, and then I wound up pitching wow. against him against I pitched against him uh, in double a um when he was with gosh i don't remember who the team was then but so it was pretty neat to see those guys and then a couple of years later play against them uh in in other leagues but uh, yeah jake Peavy, i think i lost the game i believe two to one it was like an hour and 14 minutes it was a just a fast game wow. both of us yeah, he was he was much more of a power pitcher than i was he he had a lot of strikeouts but also uh ground balls too so you know, all three of those places were really, really great. The fans were great. Um, yeah, it's just it was really neat, really fun trip. At each each so stop did, was a trip. So, so did the Brewers have a true uh, Nuke Lelouch type character? Getting back to the Bull Durham reference you made earlier. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, that's interesting. You know, there were a couple guys that threw really hard that I played with. Um, so J M Gold, I played a little bit with him. Played with sure, Nick Newton. Sure. Um, you know, I was, it was so much fun watching, um, Nick Nugenbauer throw, um, and the, you know, it's just, it was the hardest thing I ever saw, um, other than Bobby Jinx. I saw Bobby, I uh, played in the Arizona Fall League in 2003 and, uh, Bobby Jinx was pitching there, but I've never seen anybody throw the ball as hard as Nick Nugenbauer and Bobby Jinx at the time. But, um, you know, it, it's really interesting. You've got guys that come out of high school. And they are the best player in their community in their small town. And then you've got guys that pitch in college who have more command of their pitches, but also so hard. And, you know, the, especially the high, high school kids, it's pretty interesting because they'll come in and there's, I don't know, there's tons and tons of pitchers and they got to make basically four different clubs, you know, rookie, A ball, double A, well, five clubs, triple A, and then uh, the major league team. So 
I would have been overwhelmed if I was a high school player coming up thinking I was going to make a team. But there's a lot of kids that, that come up and have a lot of confidence and can throw the ball hard. But um, I had a, a minor league uh, coach tell me one time, pitching coach tell me, that unless you throw the ball 95 plus, that's not hard. And I could never throw it that hard. So I, I focused a lot more on, on command and uh, being able to throw any pitch, any count. But um, there were the, the occasional guys on each team uh, that were like that, um, that had kind of the attitude. And I thought they knew everything. But, you know, it was, uh, it was fun. Yeah, that's, that's great. So, you, you know, you go through this, this, you know, several seasons long uh, trek through the minor leagues. And then finally on, on September 3rd, 2002, you're pitching for the Brewers against the Cubs at historic Wrigley Field in Chicago. And could you tell us a little bit more about how you received the news and, and yeah. you got the call to the bigs and who was the first person that you told? What was going through your mind when you took the mound for the first time in Chicago that day? Well, it was a lot of fun. Um, we were on the road in, um, in Birmingham. And uh, I think I just pitched a couple days before. Um, I'd thrown, I don't know, somewhere around 160 innings at the time. And I thought, well, you know, there's still a shot that I could get called up. There's, you know, about a month left in the season. So, you know, just bear down and keep working hard, et cetera. Header. Well, but, you know, about a, a day after um, we got to uh, Birmingham, uh, and I think we came in pretty late one night and – at the time, that's when Halo came out. I don't know if you remember that game on Xbox, but oh yeah, um, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Halo we're, Two came out, and I, we're actually all in roughly the same age demographic with you, Dave. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> after the after the original Nintendo, I kind of gave it up when the Super NES came out because to me there were too many buttons. <laughs> I was like, I give up. So I played Halo one time in spring training. I went out and bought a, an Xbox. I bought um a hub and you know four different controllers and you know we had these you know capture the flag parties and things like that so make a long story short we rolled into Birmingham we got in late we played Halo late I didn't have to pitch the next day so I wasn't really that worried about it um but we you know we didn't go to bed till (laughs) we didn't go to bed till probably I don't know three o'clock in the morning and uh Frank Krimble is probably the best manager I've ever played for uh he called me about nine o'clock and he said, you up? I said, yeah, 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 I'm up, Frank. He says, uh, you're not up. Why are you lying to me? I said, what do you want, Frank? He says, um, Dean Taylor wants you to go sit in the airport. I said, Frank, what are you talking about? And he says, Dean Taylor, the GM of the Brewers, wants you to go sit in the airport. I said, like, what do you mean? He says, well, listen, it's, it's the year of the strike. So if the, if the MLB strikes, you're not going up. I said, well, that means if they, if they don't, or if they do strike, I'm not going up. He says, I said, so that means if they don't strike, I'm going up. He said, yeah, congratulations. So that was pretty cool. So I got in the show. Wow. Wow. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're pretty excited, but you kind of hold back too. Um, but I, uh, I got in the shower. I was in the middle of my shower and um, my roommate comes and bangs on the door. His name was Matt Parker. He was involved in a, I think a two or three trade, um, team trade with Albert Pujols. Uh, Matt Parker was my road roommate for, for the whole season. Great guy. He says, Hey, Frank's on the phone. So I get on the phone. He's like, they're not striking. Congratulations. You know, you got to get to the airport, you know, will they'll have your bags delivered and all that kind of stuff. And so the first person I called was my mother. Um, you know, she's the one in addition to my dad who sacrificed a ton so that, you know, I could play on some travel teams in in high school. It's not like it is today where, you know, there's tournament baseball and travel baseball and four or five different teams in every town. So uh, at the time, both of my parents were blue collar folks. They, uh, my mom worked two jobs. My dad worked a ton of hours a week. So um, called my mom first, told her she kind of started crying on the phone. And then, uh, of course, I called my dad, who uh, he's the one that basically taught me how to uh, how to throw my curveball. And then He's the one that worked with me in the back of the yard playing catch all those years. You know, it was interesting having my own kids now. I've got four boys. Um, how exciting it, it was at that age to play catch with your dad. And I didn't realize at the time, but he was really pretty smart. He, he was tired when he got home from work. He sold tires his whole life. But when he'd get home from work, he'd say, all right, I'll catch you. And then I'd throw a bad one. He'd say, okay, well, you throw the next bad one. I'm done. And it <laughs> taught me a lot of control. It taught me a lot of control, but at the same time, it allowed him to go inside and rest. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, oddly enough, my dad did the same thing, made me run and go get yeah. the ball every time I threw it over his head. But uh, yeah, only made it through high school myself. So <laughs> yeah. So so um, it was the it was really literally the perfect thing for me. Um, you know, is a dream come true getting drafted by Milwaukee. But as a kid, you know, the team that you kind of dreamed about playing for is the Cincinnati Reds because that's kind of the only team that existed when I was really little. Um, but, you know, the next best thing from that is getting drafted by Milwaukee. Um, I get called up and I still, where's the team? They sit in Cincinnati. So um, that was really exciting. My parents got to drive up from Knoxville. It was, you know, a five-hour drive. I had, um, I believe my uh, my grandfather had had a stroke at the time, but he uh, he was still alive. And I had aunts and uncles who came to the game. Um, so that was just exciting. Um, you know, as a kid, you know, I had family that worked at Montgomery Ribs, and I thought, well, while I, while I was in Cincinnati, I was going to eat at uh, Montgomery Inn and have their ribs. Well, after the game's over, uh, what is what do the Reds serve uh, in the the guest locker room? Well, Montgomery Inn ribs. So um, it, was, <laughs> wow. it was like the cool. It was the coolest thing. Um, but I, I got called up, and uh, so it was in it was in Cincinnati, and it was at the end of the season and I kind of dragged my foot when I pitched. So I had gone through two pairs of spikes and I don't know if it was uh, Jeffrey Hammonds or Jeff Jenkins, but they're both like, look, you know, rookie, you can't, uh, you can't go out there in those cleats. I'm like, well, I don't have any other ones. And uh, they, they said, well, we'll find you another pair. And nobody on the Brewers at the time had a size 13. So um, a guy that I kind of um, wound up watching as I was growing up in high school and stuff, Jose Rio, uh, Jose, somebody knew Jose Rio, and, and he actually gave me a pair of his cleats, so I wore his cleats the rest of the season in uh, 2002. Uh, so that was just, wow. you know, that was really cool. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Yeah, uh, and then. Uh, oh, go ahead. And then, no, I was just going to say, and then from there, we played a couple games in Houston, and I was in the bullpen, and um, I guess it was uh, Craig Biggio. Uh, he was playing left field, and, and it was like one of the first time he'd played out there, and of course, I knew who he was. He didn't know who I was, and he uh, got fooled on a pitch and and um, kind of rolled backwards. And he, there he is, looking through the chain link fence to me, and he goes, "Well, I kind of messed that one up." Um, but uh, that was a cool experience <laughs> being in Houston. Um, and uh, you know, I didn't have any suits or anything like that either with me. And uh, Ray King bought me a suit. You know, there's the thing about the veteran players <laughs> take, care of, take care of the rookie players and. So yeah, Ray King bought me a you know a, a nice polo um, suit and a belt and some shoes, and so I didn't look like you know a, a, quite the scumbag I I came rolling in looking like. But uh, we we fun. saw your comments on our uh, our Twitter post. You mentioned that when we put up something for for Ray King's oh, birthday yeah. earlier in January, we saw your Twitter post. So that we were definitely going to ask you about that tonight. So I'm glad you brought it up. That's great. <laughs> yeah, that was. That was really cool, um, you know, having, you know, veteran players looking after you. Another, you know, two other things that come to mind, you know, Jeff Jenkins would always, you know, make sure that I wasn't doing anything too wrong. There was a uh, – there was another time when um, I was pretty tired. I came in the locker room. I was, you know, I pitched, you know, the night before, so there was no chance I was pitching that day. But I kind of stayed up late, and, you know, Matt Stairs kind of walked by my locker and didn't really look at me. He just said, don't let him – don't let him see you snoozing in your locker kid you know so that was pretty cool um, <laughs> uh, but yes yeah, so like I got I was told that I was going to start at uh, against the Cubs and um, you know that was that was really exciting getting my debut I think it would have been more fun obviously doing it in front of the home crowd in Milwaukee um, but it was really neat being able to pitch in in Wrigley Field and yeah, everybody says if, if someone tells you that they're not nervous uh, the first time they make their debut, uh, they're lying. But the truth of the matter is, you know, my father at a very early age taught me about visual imagery and positive thinking. And every time I threw a bullpen before a game, I would pitch against Sammy Sosa as a right-handed batter. And then I would picture myself throwing against uh, Barry Bonds as a left-handed batter. And then, you know, all that kind of came true when, um, I was warming up in, in uh, Wrigley Field. And, you know, to me, I'd already been there a few times. So um, I really wasn't that nervous. Um, it was just another game to me, even though it was at a much higher level. 
Um, I had uh, friends and family drive up from Knoxville, Tennessee uh, to support me. Uh, I think one of my one of my best friends, uh, John Kaufman, he had a sign made up that said, uh, everybody sees Pember next. Unfortunately, I only lasted three and two thirds. So he didn't get to use that one on ESPN. But um, but that was it was just a, it was a fun time. It was a blast. Um, one of the cool things about that game, um, you know, I had I had gotten to where uh, I guess the first inning I faced Fred McGriff and there I think there were a couple guys on and all I could think about was when I was in high school and John, who I just mentioned, we were in my, my bedroom, we were trading cards and there was a Ben McDonald card that he had and he had a, and I had a Fred McGriff uh, rookie card. He says, well, you like this Ben McDonald card? I think I'll, I'll trade you for that guy, Fred McGriff. And, you know, at the time Ben McDonald was supposed to be this, you know, huge star that was coming up and I didn't know anything about Fred McGriff and he traded me for it and, you know, a couple of years later, Fred McGriff obviously, you know, got put on the map pretty big. And uh, I always gave him a hard time saying that he knew that uh, he knew what he was doing. He was taking advantage of me in that trade. So I'm on the mound at Wrigley Field, and I'm, and I'm not even thinking about facing Fred McGriff. I'm thinking about in high school as like a freshman or sophomore, he's, you know, this trade that went down. Uh, next thing you know, I'm 3-0 and on Fred McGriff. I'm like, well, they're calling a fastball down the middle. I guess I better – throw something off the plate because he didn't get paid to take three of fastballs down the middle from some rookie. So um, was able to get out of that inning. And then after the game, uh, John actually brought the card with him and gave me the Fred McGriff card after the game. It was just a cool deal. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, do you have any other, I guess, just baseball story, majors, minors, whatever it is, like just anything that either is just – really entertaining and humorous or anything you're really proud of or just anything, I guess. Yeah. You know, I, I guess, um, you know, you know, I, I really, my first goal was to get to the major leagues and my second goal, uh, was to stay there for a long period of time. You know, I was, I wish, you know, if I realized my career was going to be so short in the, in the big leagues, I probably would have taken it in a little bit more. Um, but I, you know, I was so concerned about performing and, and being invited back the following season that, you know, I, I probably didn't enjoy it as much as maybe I could have. But I'm, you know, I'm trying to make the team. And I came in relief against um, the Giants at home. And this is probably the best outing I had. I came in in the sixth or seventh inning. And um, I think I struck out Jeff Kent on a slider. And ball's going around the horn. And I hear, uh, a helmet getting thrown in the dugout, and then Jeff Kent's kind of hitting the hitting the bat rack with his bat, and I was kind of entertained by that, and I'm kind of smiling on the inside, and then they say, "Well, now batting Barry Bond." And I thought, <laughs> Oops. You know, Oops. Yeah, I said, "Okay, well, maybe I ought to refocus here." And uh, so, you know, I said earlier on the call that I'm I'm pretty analytical, so I went back to the boardroom where we're sitting and talking about. Um, different pitches that we're going to throw different uh, players and um, the uh, the scouting report on uh, Bonds came up and Ben Sheets goes, well, I got to throw him a fastball inside. And then uh, his nickname was Sarge. I'm probably going to get his name wrong, but I think maybe it was Gary Matthews, but he was the first base coach at the time. But he, he yep. time, comes in and says, Ben, you cannot throw the man a fastball inside unless you hit him he's going to hit the ball 800 feet down the right field line. So the scouting report was, we're going to throw him everything away. So I was like, okay, um, you know, whatever we throw, we're going to throw him away. So um, I come set on the mound. Um, Jorge uh, Fabregas, I think, was catching at the time. He, uh, he called an OO changeup. I said, okay, so I got to throw this guy a changeup away. And it's the first pitch. Guy hits, you know, hits a ton. Um, but he's human, just like anybody else, right? We can get him out. And then um, I, I looked behind me in the outfield, and I, I had a coach one time tell me, always make sure that your your player's in the right position. You never know what's going on. Maybe one of them's tying their shoes and not looking. So I come set, and I look behind me. There's not a soul on the field from second base over, including the outfield. I was like, I got to throw this guy away. And there's not a single person 
that's at second base, third base, or left field, or even left center. They're all basically uh, with the shift. And I said, okay, we're just going to trust it. You know, that's the scouting report. So I throw Bonds uh, an OO change up. He, he is just a hair out in front. He hits the ground ball to first. And, uh, you know, I never ran so fast at first in my life. Uh, Richie Sexton threw me the ball. I catch it, step on first. And I come in, and um, I was pretty excited about it. And then Matt Stairs kind of, you know, hits me on the, on the back and says, Barry Bonds who? Um, so that, that made me feel like I was part of the team. Um, made me, made me feel That's like awesome. I was really part of the brew crew. And, uh, you know, fortunately, um, you know, I didn't have to face Bonds again that game. So I can say that I got him that game, but, um, I got to pitch against some of the greatest players in the game. And that is, that was really fun. And, you know, Sammy Sosa, you know, Bonds, Scott Rowland, um, you know, Jeff Ken, I got to, I got to face some, some pretty good guys only a couple times, but, you know, I had, I had some, some people who followed me along the way from, from middle school to high school to college to professionally. And they asked me if I was worth it. And I said, you know, every stinking, you know, sprint that I ran, every sit up I did, every home run I gave out to learn from, it was, uh, it was all worth it to get there and spend time in Milwaukee. Awesome. All right, and then, uh, Dave, uh, kind of one last question, I, I guess. Uh, obviously, at some point um, after the 2002 season, um, you, your career kind of succumbs to injury. I don't know if you want to shed more light on the, on that and, uh, you know, when when you decided to hang it up and basically, you know, what, uh, what you've been doing since that time. Sure. So, um, at the end of 2002, I got invited to go to the uh, Arizona Fall League and uh, my arm was pretty tired at that time. It didn't necessarily hurt, but um, I wasn't pitching real good. I was trying to throw the ball, you know, as hard like, as, I, as I used to, and the ball wasn't really coming out of my hand. And um, I'd given up, I don't know, I think four runs my first time out, five runs my next time out. My ERA was somewhere in the nines or tens. But, you know, I wasn't someone who made a ton of excuses. So I at least wanted to have a good inning before I told him, hey, there's something wrong with my arm. Uh, but ultimately, when I did that, um, I rehabbed all winter, came back. Um, it felt okay in spring training, but the ball still wasn't coming out of my hand. Um, I felt like legitimately I had a shot of being maybe the fifth guy in the rotation that year. Um, I still would have a lot of work to do to get there, but never made it out of spring training. I did more rehab. I finally got an MRI. They had a uh, showed a labrum tear. I had my first surgery, and then about Four months after that, I had a follow-up surgery. That one was pretty good, and I was probably, you know, 90%, 95% off the mound, and um, something came right back. It didn't feel real good, and um, I guess they had, uh, they called it constant impingement. So, make a long story short, I had inflammation in my shoulder. It really wouldn't go away. And, um, I actually talked to, um, I'm going to, his name's uh, R.A. Dickey. I called R.A. Dickey and talked to him because I had a knuckleball in high school and I was contemplating coming back, trying to, to bring my knuckleball back, but it, it, uh, it still hurt to even throw that. So um, I had different conversations with different coaches in Milwaukee system. Some said I should coach, some said I should just go use my degree. And uh, so ultimately I decided to, um, Used my degree. I got a, a job in sales with a pharmaceutical company. Um, did pretty good there for a couple of years. Um, had that entrepreneurial spirit. Wanted to open my own business. So I opened a, an insurance agency in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And then um, really missed the medical field. So I had an opportunity. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, a buddy of mine who had a, a sales organization in the medical field selling laboratory testing. So testing that's uh, better than your storm, uh, your standard lipid panel for heart attack and stroke. Um, I said, what, what, I said, Brad, what territories do you have left? He said, um, Arkansas, Iowa, and Wisconsin. So immediately I thought, well, I want, I want to go back to Wisconsin. I mean, surely, you know, there's some physician somewhere who will let me talk to them just because I played for Milwaukee, right? Um, but, uh, but at the time, uh, I was newly married. Uh, my wife and I had our first son and uh, wound up moving to Little Rock, planned to be there for two years and then moved back to Alabama. But we really fell in love with Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, you know, great school where our kids go. 
uh, Little Rock Christian Academy, um, some really tremendously close families here. Um, I've been able to, to help coach my, my son's basketball team and now coaching baseball team. Uh, we've been here for about six or seven years and, uh, you know, getting back that entrepreneurial spirit, we opened our own laboratory in, um, let's see, March of 2014, um, testing for drugs of abuse. So you guys are probably aware, but, you know, the, a huge epidemic in our country is, uh, opioid death, heroin death. Um, we, we test. Uh, patients urine to make sure that they are taking the prescribed medicines they're supposed to and not taking uh, medicines that they shouldn't be. Uh, that kind of evolved into opening uh, an opiate addiction treatment center uh, that we have here in Texarkana. Um, you know, John Coffin, my uh, childhood friend, he and I are business partners in that, along with another guy, Darren Thomas in Indianapolis. And um, we had another best friend, Mick Deerstone, who died uh, from an opiate uh, overdose in 2010. Uh, so that's been kind of our uh, our main drive for the last few years is trying to put a dent in this uh, opiate uh, epidemic and helping people that are addicted, uh, making them understand that they can get over this and, and go on from there. But it's just, you know, um, I like to think of myself as everybody else. I'm a huge baseball fan. Um, I try to coach my kids and be the best dad I can and often fail at a lot of stuff, but uh, baseball is, is obviously in my blood, and it was a, a great opportunity to have Milwaukee. They were a ton of fun to watch this uh, this last year. So, um, so, so Dave, that, that brings us to our, our last question here. That's a great transition, and, and, and really glad to hear about other, the great work it sounds like that you're doing now in your, your post-playing career. But so you do still follow the Brewers. We noticed, you know, on Twitter that you were uh, definitely rooting for them in the playoffs, and and uh and just judging from some of the other stuff that we saw on social media so you still follow the brewers and you're still a fan I, i'm absolutely a huge fan you know i uh i typically don't have the time to watch a lot of baseball during the season but when it comes to the postseason um i'm usually catching up and man i tell you it was so much fun to watch the bullpen um and what they did down the stretch those guys those guys are really incredible i mean i don't think there's you know, one guy that threw like below 95. I mean, uh, Knabel, right. Woodman, yeah. Burns. I mean, those guys are just, I'm like, they're just, I mean, they're just lights out. They were fun to watch. Right. And uh, do you have any, uh, do you have any predictions that we can hear going into the 2019 season as, as <laughs> fans are starting to look forward to spring training here in the next week, week and a half? Yeah. You know, um, it's interesting. I think, I think for the most part, the Brewers um, typically have started out um, fairly, you know, middle of the pack. And then uh, the last couple of years uh, down the stretch, they've, they've made it to where um, they've gotten really close at winning the, uh, the division series and then, you know, the potential to go to the World Series. But I think um, if they have a bullpen like they did last year, um, and they can add a couple of offensive juggernaut, uh, juggernauts. They're gonna they're gonna be right in the thick of things in the stretch. So um, I'm gonna be right there rooting them on and watching them uh, this year too. Hopefully, I, I did have one question really I wanted great. to ask. That's um, I, I, obviously with all the success that the Brewers had last year, they were they were able to do it without basically their ace and Jimmy Nelson, who uh, also went you know obviously had the the torn labrum issue that. Uh, it's very similar to what you had gone through. Um, I guess going into this year, um, what do you think is going to be the hardest thing for for Jimmy to get on track and to be able to uh, to be able to overcome it? Hopefully. Um, well, I, I would say that um, if I was in the scenario he's in, I would say just trusting that he's healed and and really trusting his instincts again. Um, that's the biggest thing is when you throw. Um, if you're injured you kind of protect it and you're not full go. So um, I ha I'm not up to date on where he is in the process, but if he has completely healed, I would just say, uh, I would encourage him just to trust that he's healed and, and, you know, go at it a hundred percent, like, like he never had the, in the, the uh, injury. So um, that would be my encouragement for him. Awesome. That's perfect. Outstanding. Well, well hey, this has been really, you, let really me ask real. you guys something oh, sure. real quick. Uh, this is something that's been interesting and kind of bugged me for several years, but I think the same thing happened to David Justice 
Um, you guys know him by Dave Justice. And somewhere along the line, it was either a Tops or a Fleer uh, company that <laughs> changed my name. They changed my name from David to Dave. And it's so funny. I went on the Wikipedia to try to change it to David. And they wouldn't let me change it. I'm like, but I'm the guy. Let me, <laughs> <laughs> let me change the name, great. To Dave, please. But no, I, I, it's so funny because uh, I think I think the same thing happened to to David Justice. I believe he was David Justice, and then somewhere along the le- the the line, someone just said, "Ah, oh, we're just going to shorten it. We're going to call him Dave Justice." So. Um, but that was always something that was funny to me is that um, they always kind of had my name wrong, which it's it's pretty funny uh, now. People said, well, do you prefer Dave or David? I said, well, my parents named me David, but, you know, it's fine either way. But that was just another funny thing that I thought of. So <laughs> now we should know when we when we put this interview out, we should call you David. Is that uh, is that correct? Oh, that'd be great. Sure we yeah, people, right. well. And then people were like, well, who's David? It comes up as Dave. You guys got it wrong. That's probably what that <laughs> well, this is good. We can, we can break the news on Twitter to, uh, to at least our followers, if nothing else. <laughs> that'll be good. Yeah, that'll be good. <laughs> That's great. We are here with our special guest, former Milwaukee Brewers pitcher, David Pember. Uh, David, we are going to play some rapid nine, and uh, so we'll go around the horn here uh, for nine innings with you on a couple Let's of baseball-related questions. And uh, first inning, uh, you mentioned Nolan Ryan. Who, who besides Nolan would have been your favorite baseball player growing up? Charlie Hustle, number 14, Pete Rose. Very nice. good. All right. Um, Okay, what was your uh, favorite baseball memory growing up or time that you knew you were a baseball fan? Uh, Probably in high school when I got my big opportunity to pitch on the varsity team and I cut off the uh, what would have been the final out. Uh, I dove for the ball and cut it off when everybody knows the pitcher should be backing up third in that scenario. Uh, I dove and cut the ball off and went into extra innings. But obviously, I never made that same mistake again. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) All right. Here we go, third inning. Uh, Who is your all-time favorite Milwaukee Brewer? Gosh, my all-time favorite Milwaukee Brewer is probably J.J. Hardy. Awesome. That's great. J.J. and I played together. And I and he's probably the guy that I followed uh, his career um, through retirement, and who I still have some contact with today. He's a tremendous guy. When I coached my uh, my oldest son's first team, it was the Brewers in Little Rock. Uh, JJ uh, basically recorded a, a little greeting and told them congratulations on being drafted by the Milwaukee Brewers. So that you know, JJ is just a great guy. That's that's awesome. And as a quick aside to that, you know, JJ played. I think his last year in the big leagues was 2017 with Baltimore. Do you know if he's trying to get back in the game or where JJ is at these days? JJ um, is retired, as far as I know, in uh, Arizona. He just had his second child, and, and he's a great dad. That's great. Craig, speaking of uh, JJ and having a child, do you have anything you want to add about JJ? <laughs> yeah, my, my only son. Uh, I, my only son I named JJ. It wasn't necessarily after JJ Hardy, but I'm sure he influenced <laughs> in some way. That is cool. No, my, uh, when we went to get a, uh, a baseball glove for my son, uh, the first time that he got to pick his own out, I said, hey, look at this one. He says, that's JJ. You know him? I said, yeah, I know him. He goes, all right, we'll get that glove. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> that's great. Hey, that's great. Great defender at shortstop. All right. Yes. Uh, Hey, one, one David, last thing about JJ. Oh, sure. The thing yeah, that made course. him so great. The thing that made him so great is it didn't matter what kind of game he had offensively. Um, he really, really cared about his defense. There's some guys that I played with that, you know, they could boot the ball three times, but if they had two doubles, a single, and a home run, they didn't care what they did on defense. But JJ was actually he came up and played third base. I think his first game for us. Uh, Bill Hall was at shortstop. Um, JJ got a ball right in the palm at third base and it popped out. It was only error. He had the game, but he, I think he had like two doubles, a home run and a single. And, you know, on the game, the days that I pitched, I was typically the last one to leave the park because of, you know, icing my shoulder down and exercise and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But JJ was the last guy in his locker that day. And he was sitting in his locker dwelling on that one play. And I told him, I said, JJ, he said, that's probably never going to happen again. 
Um, and at that, at that point I knew what kind of a person he was and what kind of a player he was because he was sitting there thinking about how he could have been better that game. And it was all about what he did defensively. So just, I mean, just a tremendous player that, you know, uh, just a gosh, I mean, every time the ball was hitting his direction, you know, from that point forward, I knew it was probably going to be out. So just a tremendous guy. That's a, that's a great anecdote. And, you know, uh, not to get too off track here, but you know, JJ was, a guy who, from a fan's perspective, he always was a was a brilliant defensive shortstop, but he really turned into a great offensive shortstop too. I yes. mean, he really put it together and had some outstanding seasons, both for the Brewers and a season for the Twins, and and throughout his career in Baltimore, it, it yeah, it seemed like he really became a complete player uh, throughout his major league. So, from a fan's perspective, yeah. he was one of my favorites to watch as well. Yeah, really talented guy. Don't ever play him in table tennis; he'll he'll kill you. <laughs> there's a there's a great picture actually of, of him playing table tennis with Bob Euchre in spring training. I think uh, yeah, I've seen that too. picture around. <laughs> all right, uh, all right, David. The fourth inning here. What is your favorite memory as a Milwaukee Brewer? Favorite mem- memory as a Milwaukee Brewer um, is probably being able to see my family, my parents uh, after my debut uh, against the Cubs at Wrigley Field. It was a uh, it was really um, kind of a dream come true for me to have that opportunity and to see all the people that supported me, um, especially my parents and my brother and my family uh, and, you know, my best friends uh, being there on that day. That was probably the greatest memory, getting getting able to share that with them. And you got your Fred McGriff rookie card back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Although I will say Ben McDonald was a brewer for a couple of seasons, just, just for the record. <laughs> so, so. I, think it was the, I think when I got his, uh, when uh, I traded for that card, which I still have, it's somewhere in my parents' uh, house, although they've asked me to get rid of all that stuff for years. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm pretty sure he was coming up with the Orioles at the time. Yeah, 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 he came up with them, and he, he was the Brewers' big uh, off-season signee and uh, free agent acquisition in, I think, the 95 off-season, somewhere, somewhere around there. So, I, I know he spent two seasons in Milwaukee. All There's right. a lot of good people that in Milwaukee. That's right. <laughs> uh, inning number five here. Um, let's see. Uh, who is your favorite minor league teammate? Favorite minor league teammate, I've got a couple of them, um, but probably um, my roommate, uh, pretty much on every room, uh, uh, pretty much on every away game, uh, Matt Parker and uh, Ryan Miller. Those are two guys that I stay in, uh, in pretty regular contact with. And of the, um, of the three of you, who is the best Halo player? Oh, me by far. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right, sixth inning. What uh, What was your favorite minor league park? My favorite minor league park. Um, it was probably, um, I would say one of them was, well, it's, it, it'd probably be a tie between uh, Dayton, uh, where I remember facing Adam Dunn. That was probably the biggest park that I'd been in at the time. And I had some success against Adam Dunn uh, that series. Uh, he absolutely figured his swing out since then. Um, but that day, I, I had the advantage. I think he was 0 for 2, 0 for 3 maybe. Um, but I remember having some success against him there. And that was just a really, really neat park um, in Dayton. Um, and then I would probably say um, Jackson, Tennessee, um, that there's a lot of cool memories there. I, I remember getting some pretty good hits there. Um, for some reason, I hit really good against the Cubs in Double A, and uh, Jackson, Tennessee, was a place that my family could get to, and it's also a place where, um, still to this day, um, another close friend of mine, Paul Stewart, um, who spent uh, a bunch of years with the the Brewers, um, we were in the outfield for Fourth of July. And we were just kind of laying down in center field watching the fireworks until they actually came and landed on us. Um, but that was, those were some pretty cool memories. And I think, I think he actually, it was either, I don't remember who it was, myself or him. You know, time obviously makes things a little bit fuzzy, but uh, I think our hair actually got burned a little bit. It was pretty entertaining. But that was a really neat bar, ballpark. And it's, and it's one that I routinely drive past uh, now. So those, that's probably the freshest in my mind. Nice. That's great. And, and 
And for the record, uh, those of us here who are hosting the Brew Crew Review got the opportunity one time to run as the uh, racing sausages at, at Miller Park. And it happened to be a, a game where the Brewers were playing the Reds and Adam Dunn was uh, in the on-deck circle between innings and we almost ran into him. So I can tell you how intimidating he is just from the uh, the hot dog's perspective, but um, I can't imagine <laughs> pitching against him. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, I, um, do you guys remember uh, Eliezer Alfonso made it up with uh, San Francisco? Yeah, yep. So talk about it. So Eliezer um, was probably the guy who worked the absolute hardest for me from a catcher perspective in the minor leagues. Um, but uh, but when we get done here, you can Google uh, Adam Dunn versus Eliezer Alfonso. That's kind of entertaining. Definitely. <laughs> so, we'll sure. there, was a, there was a collision at the plate and just basically bowled right over Alfonso, but he kept on – he kept a hold of the baseball. It was a pretty interesting thing. Oh, so, wow. We'll have to we, – maybe we could put that on our Twitter as well. That'd be great. There so, you go. That'd be good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, David, inning number seven, you mentioned the bullpen before, but which current brewer uh, is your favorite to root for today? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, it, it's hard uh, not to get excited every time Braun comes up um, because, you know, he's uh, essentially going to put it on the launching pad. So um, I like him, uh, you know, but I also like any of the any of the new kids that are coming up that um, are trying to make a name for themselves because I remember what it was like to be there. And I remember the excitement about, you know, when the, when the phone would ring in the bullpen and your adrenaline shoots through the roof thinking it's you. And they're like, no, it's the other guy. So then you get really tired and then the, the, the phone rings again and your adrenaline shoots the roof because you think they're going to say Pember, get in there and it's not you, it's somebody else. But I, I you know, <laughs> Any of the guys in the bullpen that have not been there a long time, it's really fun to watch them. And also, I tell you, the guy who I probably enjoy watching the most though is Eddie Cedar um, at third base. <laughs> so he was our he was our uh, minor league farm director uh, when I was coming through the system. Great guy, hard worker. Um, yeah, I'm a tremendous fan of his. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was you know I remember uh, gosh who was it. Um, Oh, I don't remember who hit the home run and Cedar's giving him the high five coming around. Anyway, yeah, I, you know, he's just one of those guys that I'm I'm really excited to see the career that he's had and and the success he's had. Great guy, you're you're absolutely right. I had a chance to to talk with him when the Brewers uh, came out to play. I live in Washington D.C., but when the Brewers were out here playing the Nationals last August, I had a chance to catch up with him and just real down to earth guy and love to talk yes. baseball. Just, just a, a pleasure to have you in the organization. Dude. Yeah, very really good dude. All right, David, I'm going to uh, make inning number eight here a two-parter um, just because uh, uh, I wanted to know what your favorite ballpark food is. And so, like, I guess I was kind of wondering, like, first off, when you go to a game, what do you got? what's your favorite food at the ballpark? And then your, part two is kind of when you were out, like, in all of your travels um, as a player, what, what your favorite food was, and that could be anywhere. It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I got in trouble often um, when I would be in the stands <laughs> doing either the radar gun or the pitching chart um, because although I'm a type one diabetic, I am, you know, my favorite pastime other than baseball is food. So uh, probably a, a, anything that's unique. Um, a lot of places we went to, uh, they had different foods, but I don't remember where it was, but somewhere along the, the way, I had uh, one of the best Philly cheeks that Philly cheesesteaks I'd ever had um, at you know at some town either in Double A or or Single A. That, gosh, to this day I wish I could still get. But I mean, you can't really beat a hot dog um, as a uh, as a good starter, and then polishing it off with some popcorn. There nice. you go. So I gotta ask with cheesesteak, do you just are you cheese whiz, provolone, or what do we got going on there? Oh man, that's really great. <laughs> yeah. um, the ones, that, I mean, the the authentic ones, I guess, are pretty good with the provolone. But I, I tell you, you can't beat some good fake cheese. <laughs> so yeah, I love some, love some cheese whiz. Scott here is our ballpark uh, food connoisseur, so he has to ask that uh, that that question. That's a good question, man. <laughs> that is a good question. 
All right. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here with the ninth inning. And uh, as you know, our show, uh, Brook Review, is focused on the Milwaukee Brewers, but also kind of specifically about the Meyer Leagues throughout the years. And uh, since you spent a few years in the Meyer League, um, tell our listeners one thing about the minor leagues uh, or about my, minor league baseball life that would be surprising to listeners that they're just not aware of. Surprising. Um, I think, I think the majority of the players that come through the minor leagues, you know, I was very fortunate that I was a top 10 draft pick. Um, you know, I had a little bit of money to live off of, but um, the thing that I think most people don't realize is that these are young kids that have left home or at least from an area that they would call home for the majority of their lives, they, going to parts of the country that they've never been to before, chasing a dream that they're not getting paid for uh, in the minor leagues, but they're out there working hard because they love the game in hopes of one day uh, being on the big stage. But, um, you know, I've, I've eaten a lot of peanut butter and jelly uh, in the minor leagues, um, you know, eat, eating a lot of meals that um, you wouldn't want to have um, reruns on that I've eaten several days in a row. Um, different different things that you put into uh, a tuna sandwich just to make it different, you know, mustard, relish, a lot of different things just mm-hmm. so that you've got a different meal every day. But um, I think a lot of people would be surprised at um, what people will sacrifice to chase their dreams of getting the major leagues. And that's just part of it. And I think most of the minor leaguers are happy to do it in, in the hopes of, you know, being able to spend time, you know, one inning, one out, um, one year uh, with the big league club, it makes it all worth it. Yeah, and you were and you were one of the fortunate ones, David. I mean, you made you made not only your big league debut, but you pitched in a few games. And I, I, I guess you answered the question already. I was going to ask, but it, it, was it all worth it at the end of the day? Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. I would I would do it all again. Every every home run that I that I gave up to get back out and compete again and learn from every. Um, you know, O2 slider or fastball that I hung to learn from every time that, uh, you know, I got chewed out by a coach that I learned from, you know, baseball is a game of mistakes, home run or uh, uh, Hall of Famers get themselves out seven out of 10 times and baseball is a game of failure. And, um, you know, it was, I was very blessed and very fortunate to have enough failures that I learned and uh, was able to go up. Uh, the ladder to to reach Milwaukee, and it'll be a a great memory forever. Well, this is this has been a really great interview, and David, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to to come on here and and talk some baseball with us on a <laughs> random Sunday night in February. It's, it's great to talk some baseball <laughs> well, here in the winter. It's been really great. Thanks for your patience. I know we've been trying to get together for a while, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, following your podcast more regularly now. So I feel like uh, I know you guys really well, and one day if I get up to Milwaukee or in DC, we'll have to get together and have some uh, some cheesesteaks or some uh, some uh, hot dogs. <laughs> that, that sounds great. Or uh, if we're on the road in Little Rock sometime, we'll have to give you a call. We'd love to love to get Absolutely. together. Absolutely. If you guys well, ever need a place to stay, uh, holler at me. It sounds great. Well, thanks again, David. And, and once again, this has been David Pember, uh, former Milwaukee Brewers pitcher, joining us here tonight on the Brew Crew Review. Uh, don't forget to give us a follow on Twitter at Brew Crew Review One. Uh, we'll get to your questions on our next podcast, so feel free to send those into Brew Crew Review Podcasts with an S uh, at gmail.com. Yeah, and follow David too. Yeah, thanks, that's, guys. That's right, uh, da- David, do you want to do you want to share your uh, Twitter screen name if you want to try to get any followers? Sure, it's uh, it's at David Pember. Um, don't be confused; it's not Dave Pember. Uh, it's at David. <laughs> but. Um, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Twitter is, is extremely lively these days with all of the uh, political atmosphere, and obviously there's a lot of sports atmosphere to follow, too, but uh, would love to uh, reach out to some folks that um, got to yell at me in any of the ballparks that I played at in their town. That's right. Baseball <laughs> and politics are, are, are two great national pastimes. That's right. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I, I, I became interested in politics after I got my first injury and they had the hanging Chad in Florida. That's right. Well, we'll share some political stories on a different podcast sometime. That sounds good to me. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me on this Sunday night. And 
I guess thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Um, and go Brewers and stay classy with Captain. All right, guys. Go Brewers. Thanks again. Go Brewers. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.